chapter 26, he talks about Manandan, the sorcerer. And concerning Manandan, he says, Mamandan, who succeeded Samuel Magos, showed himself in his conduct another instrument of diabolical power, not inferior to the former, that means not inferior to Simon Magos as well. He also was a Samaritan and carried his sorceries to no less an extent than his teacher had done. And at the same time, raveled or enjoyed himself in still more marvelous tales than he. That means he enjoyed himself in his uh, marvelous tales more than Simon Magos. Okay? For he said that he was himself the savior. Wow. <laughs> okay. At least Simon said he was God or he was loftier and the loftiest of all. Okay? This one said he was the savior who has been sent down from the invisible aeons for the salvation of men. And he thought that no one could gain the mastery over the world creating angels themselves unless he had first gone through the magical discipline impacted by him and had received baptism from him. Those who were deemed worthy of this would partake even in the present life of perpetual immortality and would never die, but would remain here forever and without growing old become immortal. These facts can be easily learned from the works of Uranus. Furthermore, concerning Mamandan, he said, and Justin in the passage in which he mentions Simon gives an account of this man also in the following words. We know that a certain Mamandan, who was also a Samaritan from the village of Caparatea, was a disciple of Simon, and that he also, being driven by the demons, came to Antioch and deceived many by his magical art, and he persuaded his followers that they should not die. And there are still some of them that assert this, and it was indeed an artifice or trick of the devil to endeavor by means of such sorcerers who assume the name of Christians to defame the great mystery of godliness by magic art and through them to make ridiculous the doctrines of the church concerning the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the dead. But they that have chosen these men as their savior have fallen away from the true hope. Wow. Okay. So we can see some of these deceptive heretic that came up during the church age and one of them was this mamanda who was also a disciple of simon magos as well okay so having said concerning this he went on further and he talked about the heresies of the ibiomites in chapter 27 of this writing and he said concerning the ibiomites the evil demon however being unable to tear certain others from their allegiance to the Christ of God, yet found them susceptible in a different direction, and so brought them over to his own purpose. The ancient quite properly called these men Ibiomites, because they held poor and mean opinion concerning Christ, for they considered him a plain and common man, who was justified only because of his superior virtue and was the fruit of the intercourse of a man with Mary. In their opinion, the observance of the ceremonial law was altogether necessary on the ground that they could not be saved by faith in Christ alone and by a corresponding life. There were others, however, beside them that were of the same name but avoided the strange and absurd belief of the former and did not deny that the Lord was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, inasmuch as they also refused to acknowledge that he pre-existed, being God, Word, and Wisdom, they turned aside into the impiety of the former, especially when they, like themselves, endeavor to observe strictly the bodily worship of the Lord. So, there were two sets in this Ibionite category. There were those that held the opinion that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was a product of Joseph and Mary, while there were those who held the opinion that the Lord Jesus Christ was a product of Mary the Virgin and the Holy Spirit. Okay, but what they rejected, what the other 
group rejected was that Christ was not God. He was not pre-existent, okay? And he was not the word, neither was he the wisdom of God. So they turned aside into the impiety of the other former group as well, into the godlessness of the other former group and began to behave like them and carry out bodily worship of the law of Moses, okay? So these guys were definitely Jews as well, as we can see from this writing, because they definitely had separation among themselves. So concerning the Ebionites, he went on further and he says, These men, moreover, thought it was necessary to reject all the epistles of the apostles, whom they call an apostate from the law. So these men rejected all the epistles of the apostles that we have today because they say it does not agree with the law of Moses. Okay? And they used only the so-called gospel according to the Hebrews and made small amount of the rest. Okay? So the epistle that was written to the Hebrew, they received that one. But all the other epistles, they rejected. So can you see the division that was going on in the church world at this time? Now the church as of that time rejected the book of Hebrew, rejected the Apostle John book of Revelation, rejected his second epistle, rejected his third epistle, rejected the second epistle of uh, Peter. Okay. They rejected the book of Hebrews, but these guys rejected all the other epistles that the church held that time, and they accepted the book of Hebrew. <laughs> so you can see the division that was going on among the church brethren as of that time. Okay, so furthermore, concerning the Ebionites, he said, the Sabbath and the rest of the discipline of the Jews, they observed just like them. But at the same time, like us, they celebrated the Lord's Day as a memorial of the resurrection of the Savior. Therefore, in consequence of such a cause, they received the name of Ebionites, which signified the poverty of their understanding. For this is the name by which a poor man is called among the Hebrews. <laughs> what a conclusion. So they named them the Ebionites because of their lack of understanding. Okay, how true. All right, let's go on to see furthermore concerning another heresy that they thought about as well. So. In chapter 28, he talked about Serentius, the heresiac. Concerning Serentius, he said, We have understood that at this time, Serentius, the author of another heresy, made his appearance. Caius, whose words we quoted above in the disputation, which is ascribed to him, writes as follows concerning this man. But Serentius also, by means of revelations, which he pretends, were written by a great apostle, bring before us marvelous things which he falsely claims were shown him by angels. And he says that after the resurrection, the kingdom of Christ will be set up on earth and the flesh dwelling in Jerusalem will again be subject to desires and pleasure. And being an enemy of the scripture of God, he had sat with the purpose of deceiving men and there is to be a period of a thousand years for marriage festivals. Wow. So you can see what Serentius is talking about here. So the church labeled this guy a false preacher, okay, as one of the heresia. But if you take a look at what he's saying, this is what is being preached today, even in our generation, about the millennial reign of Christ, where he talks about a thousand years. I, I believe he's speaking from the book of John here, the revelation of John. Okay, and he's talking about the reign of Christ on the earth in Jerusalem. But as of this time, mind you, the church had rejected the revelation of John. Okay, so having rejected the revelation of John, Serentius is picking his own teaching from there and he's explaining it to the brethren. And they declared him a heresiac. Okay, and there are other things that he also talks about that does do with the desires and the pleasures of the flesh. Okay. So, but all of these, we'll look at in a more further detail when we're dealing with the canon of scriptures. And Dinosaurs, who was bishop of the parish of Alexandra in our day, in the second book of his work on the promises, where he said some things concerning the apocalypse of John, which he draws from tradition, mentioned this same man in the following words. So Dinosaurs talks about this man and he says, but they say that Serentius, who founded the sect which is called after him Serentians, 
desiring reputable authority for his fiction, prefixed the name, for the doctrine which he taught was this, that the kingdom of Christ will be an earthly one. Hmm. Okay. And as he was himself devoted to the pleasures of the body, altogether sensual in his nature, he dreamed that the kingdom would consist in those things which he desired, namely in the delights of the belly and of sexual passion, that is to say, in eating and drinking and marrying, in festivals and sacrifice and the slaying of victims, under the guise of which he thought he could indulge his appetite with better grace. <laughs> okay, that is interesting concerning Serentius. He went on further and he talked about Serentius and he said, these are the words of Dionysius, but Iranius, in the first book of his work, against heresies, gives some more abominable false doctrine of the same man. And in the third book, relates a story which deserves to be recorded. He says on the authority of Polycarp that the Apostle John once entered a bat to bat, but learning that Serentius was within, he sprang from the place and rushed out of the door, for he could not bear to remain under the same roof with him. And he advised those that were with him to do the same, saying, Let us flee, lest the bat fall, for Serentius, the enemy of the truth, is within us. No, there is no way Apostle John would do that. <laughs> so how true are these words? Okay. Rather, Apostle John would confront this fellow, just like Apostle Peter confronted Simon Magos. If this guy was bringing a false doctrine and Apostle John was really here, Apostle John would confront him and they would begin an exchange of scriptural explanation and Apostle John would, would bring to him the understanding of the true gospel of Christ and the explanation of what Serentians was trying to present to the people. Okay? think about it people that didn't run away from the roman emperors and roman generals will now be running away from just one false teacher so-called claim serentius no there's no way apostle john will do that okay but let's go on further to see concerning the church and the various uh, sects that came up during the church age in chapter 29 he says nicholas and the sect named after him he said concerning Nicholas, at this time the so-called sect of Nicolaitans made its appearance and lasted for a very short time. Mention is made of it in the Apocalypse of John. They boasted that the author of their sect was Nicholas, one of the deacons who with Stephen were appointed by the apostles for the purpose of ministering to the poor. Clement of Alexandra in the third book of his Stromata, relates the following things concerning him. Nicholas, you mean this Nicholas that was chosen as one of the deacon? Interesting. Okay, so let's go on further to see who this guy was. They said that he had a beautiful wife and after the ascension of the Savior, being accused by the apostles of jealousy, he led her into their midst and gave permission to anyone that would wish to marry her. For they said that this was in accord with that saying of his that one ought to abuse the flesh and those that have followed his heresies imitating blindly and foolishly that which was done and said commit fornication without shame wow so this nicholas who was among the seven deacon that was selected to attend to the tables in the book of acts he was the one that was nicolai that raised the sect, the Nicolaitans. Hmm, that is interesting. Okay. So, concerning Nicholas, he said, But I understand that Nicholas had to do with no other woman than her to whom he was married, and that, so far as his children are concerned, his daughters continued in a state of virginity until old age, and his son remained uncorrupt. If this is so, when he brought his wife, whom he jealously loved, into the midst of the apostles, he was evidently renouncing his passion. And when he used the expression to abuse the flesh, 
he was inculcating self-control in the face of those pleasures that are eagerly pursued. For I suppose that, in accordance with the command of the Savior, he did not wish to serve two masters, pleasure and the Lord. Pleasure, the Lord didn't say pleasure and the Lord. No, the Lord said mammon and the Lord. Okay, the two masters that the Lord talked about was not the pleasure of the body. The Lord said it was mammon and the Lord. So this is wrong. If that is what Eusebius was presuming that Nicholas was doing here. But from what we can see here, this is abstinence here that uh, Nicholas is pursuing here. He's coming up with the doctrine of abstinence. And this is not what the Lord was talking about. Rather, the Lord was talking about mammon and serving God. Okay? Not serving pleasure and serving the Lord. No, that is not what the Lord said. Okay, but let's go on further, regardless of that. But they said that Matthias also taught in the same manner that we ought to fight against and abuse the flesh and not give away to it for the sake of pleasure, but strengthening the soul by faith and knowledge. So much concerning those who then attempt to pervert the truth, but in less time than it has taken to tell it, become entirely extinct. Okay, this is very interesting about Nicholas. If it's the same Nicholas that the apostles selected, that is very interesting to find out about him. So, regardless of that, let's go on further to see what he said. Stay tuned and for more on this episode on church history. Next, we will talk about the fourth book on Eusebius on church history. Full clips on YouTube on scriptural and spiritual understanding. You are blessed.